wherever you uh, are to our uh, last session of the online discussion series, Reframing Reproduction. My name is Daria Bineschek and I'm a program officer at the Gunda Werner Institute uh, at the Heinrich Böll Foundation and together with my colleagues Jana, Neda and Adna from our Global Unit for Feminism um, at our office in Sarajevo, we organize this discussion series that today comes to an end, sadly, but it was a great journey. Um, during the last two months uh, in five inspiring sessions that you can watch also um, later if you are interested and if you have missed one of the sessions. In these sessions, we have explored together with activists, scholars, medical professionals, uh, what reproductive autonomy means when we look at it from an intersectional and human rights perspective. And the concept that guided us through this exploration was reproductive justice, the topic of today's panel. Um, it is a framework and practice that raises important questions of social justice, of structural inequalities, of human rights, when talking about topics like contraception, birth, abortion, parenting, and reproductive technologies, or population politics even. Um, and the concept reminded us in each and every session that it's not enough to just focus on what we call reproductive rights or reproductive health or health care. Um, but that we need to ask other questions like whose reproduction is made possible and whose is not. Um, this is ultimately a question of social justice and global power structures, and we need a more comprehensive and holistic approach to formulate uh, progressive and inclusive feminist demands and programs so that we can truly enable people to make free and informed decisions about their bodies and about their future. Um, man, this is one of the learnings I think that we can deduct from our series so far. And today we want to closely look at this concept, um, where it came from and where, where it is now and where we want to go with it. So before I hand over to our special guest today, which is Loretta Ross, um, one of the co-founder of, of this inspiring concept in practice, I want to share with you just some learnings that I deducted from the panel discussion um, or from the previous panel discussion, sorry so that we maybe have also some concrete examples to talk about today. Um, so one thing that I think we really learned in the first session on um, population politics is that so-called development programs until today in the global south and also contraception programs for certain marginalized groups are guided by the idea of overpopulation and are ultimately biopolitics. Um, they are guided by the idea that certain people should reproduce and others should not, or they should have less children. And yeah, behind many of these projects, there's, there seems to be enhancement of bodily autonomy, but actually there is a lot of control of fertility and birth. I think this is one learning that we can already deduct and maybe discuss further today. Um, and the structures that lie behind these biopolitics they are informed by colonialism, racism, ableism, classism, heterosexism. I'm sure there's other discriminative structures behind that we can discuss. Um, so yeah, the question who has access to actual free decisions about their bodies and families and who has not is a political question. And it is not only individual, but something that we have to tackle in a collective manner. I think this is something that we can definitely um, already say after five sessions of talking about these topics. Um, and reproductive justice as a concept enables us to ask these and other complex questions. So today's panel will try to get all of these questions together. Um, and we are very excited and honored to have Loretta Ross, co-founder of the Reprodu Reproductive Justice Framework here today with us. Um, it is very early uh, for you, Loretta. So thank you so much for being here. And to make us maybe more understand the origins and also the future of this framework that you co-created. Uh, Loretta is a feminist activist and academic in the field of human rights and reproductive justice. And she's co-founder of the sister song, Women of Color uh, Reproductive Justice Collective. And as I said, co-creator of the theory of reproductive justice. Um, and after the keynote of Loretta, there will be um, a panel discussion moderated by Shanjaf, our great moderator that has guided us through the sessions uh, together with Kalpana Wilson and Rola Yasmin. But for now, uh, Loretta, the floor is yours and I'm very excited to listen to your keynote. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's a very difficult time 
to talk about reproductive justice here in the United States right now, because we have a very conservative, religiously oriented activist Supreme Court that has decided to overturn Roe v. Wade, the 1973 decision legalizing abortion. And of course, we should not be still fighting the battles of the 19th century in the 21st. And so we women in the United States <clears throat> are mobilizing or organizing all over again to fight for our human rights and reproductive justice. And I am personally angry because 52 years ago, I had an abortion and it should not be harder for a woman to obtain an abortion now than it was 52 years ago. And so as an old feminist, we never actually give up, do we? We can't pass the torch because we're still setting things on fire. So all we can do is make sure that we center the most vulnerable women in our land so that they don't die because of the awful decisions of men. That's always what feminism is about, isn't it? Worldwide, so that women don't die because of the awful decisions of men. So I'm going to talk about the origins of reproductive justice and maybe a brief definition. You probably already know this, but it doesn't hurt to reaffirm it, and then talk about some of its future implications in the time I have. In 1994, there was a pro-choice conference in Chicago, Illinois, and 12 Black women were amongst the 200 participants at that conference. And we heard that day a presentation by the administration of then President Clinton where they were trying to get universal health care reform done in the United States, we do not have free and public access to health care. And the Democratic Party, one of our two political parties, decided that if they omitted reproductive health care from health care reform, that they could lessen the opposition of the Republicans. Not only was that a bad strategy, but the Clinton administration came to a feminist conference and asked us to endorse a health care plan that mainly benefited men when you omit reproductive health care from the plan. And so we 12 Black women, we heard this plan presentation and it didn't make sense to us. Not only was that a very suspicious political strategy, but we didn't like the way all discussions of abortion were always isolated from the human rights and the social justice issues that precede abortion. Because when a woman is facing an unplanned pregnancy, before she decides whether to continue or terminate that pregnancy, she has to decide whether she can stay in school, whether she has a bedroom to put that child in, whether or not she will keep, be able to keep her job, or will she experience violence from her partner if she tells him she's pregnant. I mean, there's a lot of human rights issues that are upstream of the pregnancy decision. And if a woman has good answers to those human rights questions, then she'll turn an unplanned pregnancy into a wanted one. But if she has bad answers to those questions, then she may even turn a planned pregnancy into an abortion. So the decision doesn't start with the pregnancy. The decision starts with what else is going on in her life before she is pregnant. And that's what reproductive justice attempts to describe, that you have to pay attention to the whole woman and her entire life in order to help her make the best decision possible for herself in whether to keep or terminate a pregnancy. So the isolation of abortion from other social justice issues 
has always felt wrong to us. And so we decided on three basic tenets of reproductive justice. We spliced together, first of all, the term reproductive rights and social justice, and that's where the term reproductive justice came from. And the three basic tenets are that we join with the pro-choice movement, which fights for abortion rights, in fighting for abortion rights with them. And not only that, but we are constantly fighting for the right to use birth control as well, as you always have probably heard. But because we were Black women, who are constantly subjected to strategies of population control, as y'all have already discussed, then we also have to fight for the right to have the children that we want to have and the conditions under which we want to have those children, which includes using a birth worker, a doula, or a midwife, and the right to refuse unnecessary medical interventions that the woman's birth plan does not want, which of course includes unnecessary cesarean sections, which are often prescribed in this country at least for the convenience of the doctor and not the patient. And they cost three times as much as a childbirth. So they make a lot of money prescribing cesarean sections that women don't need. And then the third tenet of reproductive justice the right to raise our children in safe and healthy environments is probably the most inclusive and capacious because this brings us into conversation with every human activity because every empire needs bodies for their economy, for their workforce, for their military. I mean, they, our bodies, our babies, are the empire's currency. And so this deals with like gun violence, for example, or affordable housing, or health care, or quality education system, support for mothers and fathers and other parents when their children are disabled, or things like that. And so the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, and the right to raise your children in safe and healthy environments are the three original tenets of reproductive justice. But then 10 years later, a fourth tenet was added. And that was because people who are lesbian, gay, queer, transgender are questioning, felt that the original three frameworks or tenets were too focused on reproduction and the wombs. They were too womb-centric, they called it. And so they added a fourth tenet called the human right to sexual pleasure, to bodily autonomy, with gender self-determination. And so when people talk about reproductive justice now, they talk about, again, the right to have a child, not to have a child, to parent your children safely, or to decide that you don't want to participate in reproduction and that you have uh, the right to sexual pleasure, body autonomy and gender identity. And so having said that, it's a lot easier to claim reproductive justice than to achieve it. This conversation happened in June of 1994. In September of 1994, there was the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, Egypt. And I was one of the 12 women who had been in Chicago who got a chance to go to Cairo. And in Cairo, I learned that the global women's health movement, particularly that part from the global south, were using the human rights framework to demand the same things that we were demanding from reproductive justice, but doing so under the very limits of the US Constitution, which of course with the Roe decision we found out is very limited. <laughs> and so we felt that the human rights framework that women of the global South were using was a much more inclusive, international, interdependent, and intersectional analysis 
on which to base reproductive justice. And of course, we're all familiar with the eight categories of human rights protections, you know, civil rights, political rights, economic, social, cultural, environmental, developmental, and sexual. And I'm convinced that there is a ninth category of human rights that is developing that we're all going to need, and that's digital human rights, the right to be connected to the World Wide Web. So anyway, once we saw how broad and inclusive the human rights framework was, then our motto began to, uh, became to bring human rights home because the United States is the singular country in the global North that does not respect the human rights framework. <laughs> That's why it's not a member in good standing at the United Nations or in any other human rights body, because it is arrogant enough to believe that we don't need to obey international human rights standards because we're the best country. I mean, if you ever want to see the patriarchy, think about it. We're celebrating the 4th of July today. Anyway, so. Since then, quite accidentally, the reproductive justice framework has become, has begun to move from the margins of the discourse from women of color into the mainstream so that it is supplanting other terms like reproductive health, reproductive rights, reproductive freedom, pro-choice, and that is totally incidental and I would almost add accidental because a lot of people mistakenly think that we black women created reproductive justice as a way to counter the framing that was most popularly used by white women, which is pro-choice or anti-abortion. And that is not true, actually. As a matter of fact, for it to be true, we would have had to center white women in our lens and discuss what they were doing. And instead we centered ourselves in the lens and discussed what we needed. So it was not a framework designed to speak to white women or about white women. So I've heard, her, I, heard I have heard a lot of white women make that assumption because they themselves are tired of the binary of the pro-choice anti-abortion debate, and they want to go beyond that. So I understand it, but it's not historically accurate. So in closing, I want to talk about a concept that I've been writing about and thinking about for a while. I didn't originate this term, but I certainly am borrowing it, and that's called reproductive futurism. I am really concerned about the techno utopia that all of our scientific advances are wrongfully promising us when it comes to reproductive politics. First of all, too many people make lots of money over promising things that science simply can't deliver. For example, in our country, they charge each woman $20,000 to store her so-called fertilized eggs. But they don't tell the person paying $20,000 that only 13% of those stored eggs successfully result in a baby. So you have an 87% chance of failure and yet you're convinced to pay $20,000 for that can. And a lot of our corporations are offering uh, egg storage as a work benefit to try to entice more women, young women of fertile age into their workforce. And so that's an example of techno utopia that simply is not true. I frankly believe that because we have these pre-existing human rights violations and social inequalities in our society, that technology, even reproductive technology, will be used to just upgrade our inequalities rather than 
reduce them because in the advertisements that you see for designer babies, where they say that they can pre-gene select what kind of traits your babies have and how intelligent they are. And even one ads uh, advertised that it could reduce their likelihood of crime or something. But the point is, I don't think anybody can imagine that those designer babies will be black or brown or Asian. They are the commodity is white baby. And so we know that these pre existing inequalities will be upgraded with assisted reproductive technology. And we're also already seeing that with the exploitation of women in the global south for surrogacy, taking advantage of the systemic and intentional underdevelopment of the global south so that we can, as uh, you know, global north countries can exploit their resources, take advantage of their populations. And really, we find that a depopulated country can't really protect its own natural resources. And so when we talk about population control, we always take a uh, economic analysis to our geopolitics, as opposed to simply saying it's the global south system versus the global north. Sorry, I'm in a desert, so I get very thirsty really fast. And so I like people to start thinking about how can we apply the reproductive justice framework to the 21st century. As I started out, I'm really sad that the United States is leading the world and going backwards towards authoritarianism authoritarianism, towards neo-fascism, towards white supremacy, when we should be making the 21st century the century where we finally have full and universal human rights. But unfortunately, this is what happens when an embattled minority want to permanently seize power. They start by disenfranchising people, they weigh different votes and different political parties, uh, pa parties differently so that they can maintain power. And I think the more ironic thing that they're going to do in the United States is expand the definition of who's counted as white as a way to increase their numbers so that high income Asian Americans, high income Latinos, and high income and passing indigenous people and even maybe even some black people will be counted as white based on income so that they can maintain political power. But we've seen this before in South Africa, obviously, under apartheid, where a minority of people tried to control the majority and it didn't end very well for that minority, even though we're still dealing with the legacy of apartheid in South Africa, the same way we're dealing with the legacy of the enslavement, anti-Semitism, uh, all kinds of violences here, anti-immigrant violences, you know, the genocide against Native American people here, the laws against LGBT people, all of that is still going on in our society as well. And so I'm going to shut up there and uh, see if there's questions for me coming from the panel. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Loretta. Um, thank you so much for the many great impulses um, that you gave, which I'm sure we'll get back to throughout the panel um, discussion today. Um, I can't I can't stress honestly how timely our panel today is, and I'm so um, happy and honored that uh, we've got these great panelists um, talking about the topic today. Um, as Loretta mentioned in the beginning, um, something huge is happening in the United States that also has grave consequences for the rest of the world. Um, the landmark Roe versus uh, Wade decision has been overturned and that means that the power around legal access to abortion is now in the hands of local and state um, governments. 
And the moment has um, ignited not just conversation about legal access to abortion in the United States, but also in Germany, in India, in Lebanon, in, in so many countries around the world. And um, today, together with our panelists, um, I invite you all to extend this conversation um, and ask um, ourselves and each other what this might mean for our, for our bigger, broader attitudes towards um, what it means to have reproductive rights um, and human rights in general. Um, because Roe versus Wade is not just about choice, it's much more than that. Um, but I don't wanna to take too many talking points away from our panelists. Um, before I move on to um, introducing them, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping rules, just as usual. Um, uh, so we are live streaming this event, we are recording this event. Um, and if you wanna participate in the chat, you can do so, um, but you can also participate in the discussion on your social media channels. You can use those specific hashtags to collect your feedback and to connect with each other. Um, feel free to post about this event, uh, but also feel free to, to treat the chat room as a kind of virtual livery or living room for all of you to kind of connect with one another and in introducing your work. Um, and uh, you can, of course, you can, you're free to ask questions throughout the panel discussion. We will be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and um, what else do I, oh yes, uh, the, the whole conversation will be translated, um, is now being live translated um, to German, French, and Spanish. Um, and you can access that at the, at the little globe at the bottom of your screen. Um, thank you so much in advance um, to the translation team who's also, also always done a brilliant job in these past few um, discussions that we've had. And also many thanks to the organizing team again, Naida, Jana, Edna, and Teria. You've done an amazing job and I was so honored to be part of this discussion series. Uh, now on to our panelists. You all know Loretta Ross. Um, let's go to the um, two of my uh, two of the other panelists that I've now had the honor to um, get to know a little bit. Um, let's start with Kalpana Wilson. Kalpana, you are a lecturer in geography at Burbeck, and your research explores um, questions of race and gender, labor, neoliberalism, and reproductive rights and justice with a particular focus on South Asia and its diasporas. Um, Kalpana has a bachelor's in economics from the University of Sussex and master's arts, a master of arts degree in area studies and a PhD in political economy from SOAS, uh, University of London. Kalpana has also previously taught at the London School of Economics and SOAS and she is the author of Race, Racism, and Development, Interrogating History, Discourse, and Practice, and has published widely on race, gender, international development, women's agency, and rural labor movements. Welcome, Kalpana. On to Rola. Rola Yasmin is a registered nurse and researcher based in Beirut, Lebanon, and um, working on sexuality and gender and their intersections with other economic sociopolitical determinants. She is the executive director of the A Project in Lebanon, which is a non-governmental organization established since 2014. The A Project works on affirming agency and autonomy in sexuality and mental health, while advancing a political discourse around sexual, reproductive, and mental health, and seeking alternatives to counteract medical patriarchy's restrictive and reductive approaches towards the bodies of women and also trans people. Before founding the A Project, Rola had co-published several papers on youth, sexual, and reproductive health through her work at the American University of Beirut, um, the Faculty of Health Sciences there, and Rola has a Master of Science degree in Reproductive and Se Sexual Health Research from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the United Kingdom since 2009, and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from AUB since 2007. Thank you so much, all three of you, to be on this panel. I, um, I want to start with you, Loretta. 
Um, mm. Cause I want to start with a very que obvious question for all of us. Um, what now, where do we go in the US um, from here after what's happened uh, with Roe versus Wade? Well, I wish there was clarity on that. Uh, in a functioning democracy, there's a large difference between the different political parties. And right now we're not sure if we have sufficient difference because the Democratic Party has been not hostile to abortion rights, but barely supportive of them. And in many ways, omitting them over the decades because they're always trying to appeal to a conservative white base that does not support abortion rights. And so right now they are really trying to figure out first, number one, should they expand the number of seats on the Supreme Court to deal with the unfair balance that this court packing has happened under the current you know, Republican party even though Republicans have only won one of the last eight elections in the popular vote, they have appointed 15, nine of the last 15 Supreme Court judges that have made it to the court. And so they have disproportionate and unfair and in many ways immoral power to decide our legal system. And so, one would think that the Democratic Party would wholeheartedly endorse the thought of enlarging the Supreme Court, which has been done before. There's no constitutional requirement for the number of judges. And yet they're very timid to talk about that. The same way they are timid in addressing the electoral college that results in awarding the presidency often to the person who received fewer popular votes. We're not really a one man, one vote democracy. We're a one vote. And then you hope the electoral college is a packed democracy. And so that should also be up for consideration. But once the court has ruled, there's very little the president can do through executive order. And so it takes Congress and right now our Congress is split 50 to 50 in the Senate. And so it is impossible to get legislation through the Senate because two of our so-called democratic Congress people often vote for Republican plans and projects. And so even though it should be a balanced Senate in Reality, it is not. Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema are nominally Democrats, but they always oppose Democratic plans as if because they get elected in very conservative districts. So they're kind of like fake Democrats as far as we're concerned, Democrats in name only. So what do we do? We have to center the most vulnerable women in our land. So we're going to do whatever is both legal and illegal to help these women. That means that we will have an underground railroad transporting women to friendlier states because we're gonna have a patchwork of state-based laws. We are going to make sure that we provide the abortion pills as widely as possible to, uh, to the affected communities, particularly in the deep south, that they've already rushed in state laws banning abortion. And they're also trying to criminalize the abortion pills. And so we're very prepared to set up defense teams who are going to have to defend in court against criminal charges, women who provide abortions, women who obtain abortions, women who provide the pills, and they already in Texas have a bounty hunter system where $10,000 will be paid for reporting someone, either providing or obtaining an abortion. So they have financialized the hunt against women 
which is really a sad neoliberal kind of thing to do. Not only are our human rights apparently for sale, but a sale, you know, for sale to anybody who wants to make a quick $10,000. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to fight legislatively. We're going to fight judicially. But most of all, we're going to fight in our communities to make sure that the women who are most vulnerable have access to the information and services that we feel compelled to provide. Fortunately, 2022 is not 1973. And now we have hundreds of thousands of people who know how to provide abortions, even through the old DNC methods. And so we're gonna do whatever we can, even risking jail to protect women. We have no choice. Thank you so much. I love the fighting spirit. I love the optimism. I love the positive note. I think we all can, I think we all need that in this moment. Um, Kalpana and Rola, you two have been applying the reproductive justice framework in your research and in your work. And how did you first learn about the framework? And when did you start using it actively? Um, perhaps um, Kalpana, would you like to start? Thanks, Sham, and thanks so much, Loretta, for that really inspiring uh, talk, reminding us of the whole history and also, of course, um, telling us about what's happening on the front line with this um, terrible crisis which which um, women in the U.S. are facing. And, and as Sham said, um, you know, giving us some cause for hope and optimism and ways that we can show our solidarity. Um, and um, yeah, thanks to the organizers for such a timely and, and important event. Um, in terms of reproductive justice personally, um, I think, you know, I came to it through, you know, as you were saying, my work looking at um, population policies because I, I, a lot of my work is on international development. And um, a lot of my work was really talking about how we need to talk about racism when we're talking about international development um, initiatives. Um, because, you know, that tends to be sort of pushed aside. That tends to be like, yeah, we can talk about racism when we're looking at the US or maybe Britain, you know, maybe South Africa or maybe Brazil, but not globally, right? But when we're talking about uh, capitalism, imperialism, and so on, race is absolutely central to that. And that's where uh, development initiatives are located, in my view. They are essentially uh, part of um, ongoing imperialism. Um, so yeah, so I was basically saying that, you know, we have to talk about racism when we talk about international development. And one way that that's very clear is when we look at um, population policies, because population policies, as Loretta said, are not just about numbers, right? They're about targeting particular people. They're about uh, you know, it's it's not about just, you know, we've got too many people on the planet. It's about who is going to be targeted by those policies of forcible sterilization, which we've seen in India, we've seen earlier in Peru and so many other places. Uh, who are the women? And when I say women, I'm 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 really talking about everyone who can who can become pregnant. I'm using women in that sense as a shorthand. Um, so please bear with me. Um, but, you know, who are the people who, then who are being targeted for uh, unsafe and untested contraceptives, right? So all of that made me, um, drew me to um, think about these things. But also, of course, it was a matter of seeing uh, the resistance being waged by feminists in the global south or the majority world. Um, against these policies, um, against these policies which were kind of systematically seeking to prevent women from choosing to have children, um, while at the same time denying them access to safe and, you know, contraception which they could control. Um, 
And these feminists always had a much more structural approach. So they always talked very much in terms of not just individual choice, but you know how questions of imperialism were central, how questions of race and class were central. In an Indian context, which I look at, how questions of caste are absolutely central, right? It's Dalit women, so-called uh, untouchable women, who are the most targeted for sterilizations, along with the indigenous or Adivasi women, right? So all of this was being talked about. And then also, I suppose, on a personal note, having grown up in the UK, I was kind of, you know, this was like, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot going on among uh, Black and South Asian women to counter, um, you know, things like uh, the way in which you know, they found they would always be uh, prescribed drugs like Depo-Provera, which, you know, we know are, are have so many side effects, are so unsafe in so many ways. So this coercive um, um, a nature of the, the state in regards to women's uh, social and reproductive health and rights was very much something in the UK and still is. And, you know, in fact, my, my mother was one of the sort of first generation of, of South Asian feminists in Britain, um, working with, you know, uh, the organization AWAS, which was part of a broader coalition, the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent. And I mean, she, you know, talks about the way in which, um, yes, as Loretta said, it was never about just, uh, you know, facing uh, you know, white women and, and talking to them, but it was about organizing the communities and so on. But it was also about getting those questions onto wider feminist platforms where they did not exist at that time. Um, so, you know, talking about uh, population uh, control when you talk about, uh, you know, reproductive rights. And I suppose, you know, all of this reproductive justice has been tremendously inspiring as a concept. It's given the kind of conceptual home to all of this, I feel, all of these questions, um, and a way in which those conversations can be had. And particularly, um, I think the fact that it hasn't been narrowly focused, as Loretta explained so powerfully, on uh, you know simply questions of reproduction narrowly understood in terms of having or not having children, but this whole question about the wider uh, context in which we can actually, um, uh, you know, bring up children, uh, you know, continue with our lives, which is being continuously undermined. So for example, in India, you know, I've been looking at the fact that, uh, you know, indigenous or Adivasi women who faced, who've been taken to sterilization camps, also live in parts of the country which are rich in minerals and are being displaced from their from their homes. They're being dispossessed of their land. And all of these things are linked up very closely. Um, because you know, how do you how do you reproduce uh, you know, your own life? How do you continue? How do you bring up your children? How do you reproduce a community under those kinds of circumstances. Right now, it's a tremendously um, Islamophobic right-wing regime in India, and I'll talk more about that later. But, you know, uh, we're seeing uh, the minority Muslim communities' homes being bulldozed by the state. So what does that mean for reproductive justice? So that's why I found it to be an incredibly um, uh, productive and, and useful as well as inspiring uh, concept. Thank you, Kalpana, also for the overview of your work and the kind of questions you also ask yourself in the research. Um, Rola, you do the same, but a few thousand kilometers um, elsewhere, um, which is in Lebanon. Um, you also work with uh, the reproductive justice framework in your own work, um, in your own research. Um, when did you first start using it? And what is the value of proposing this framework as a new analysis tool also in Lebanon? Just need to unmute yourself. You still unmute. I don't you should know. be able to unmute yourself now. Oh, okay. 
Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I was trying to speak, but my voice was not was taken from me. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Anyway, uh, hello. So it's so nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Kalpana. And thank you, Loretta. I'm a big fan. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I think using reproductive justice for us, um, it kind of came organically. It was kind of by mistake even to some extent because it's a, it's a practice, right? So it's a framework that can, so we, we've been working, I think we've been working in the reproductive justice framework, I think. And we've been learning that, I think just, I think you learn about reproductive justice by, by just kind of getting slapped across the face by all these inconsistencies and all this, um, you know, figuring out, oh, one way to do something and then figuring out, oh, no, that that pathway is is rigged. Like just I think just finding so many, um, so many, uh, what is it, paradoxes, I guess, within the same field. I think, um, you know, the pro-choice never made sense because it's, you know, because the idea of choice is it's funny to say choice when like you don't seem to have any choices. So it always felt, you know, so I'd never actually really, it never resonated. Um, you know, I, I think about, um, you know, women and people who get pregnant trying to get an abortion here. Um, and it's, well, if you're unmarried and you've had sex outside of marriage, that this abortion is, it's accepted. <laughs> it's a good abortion. It's not a bad abortion. You have to maintain, uh, you know, uh, marriage as this, uh, you know, patriarchal, hetero, patriarchal institution, right? It's important. Um, and so being not a virgin or not having kids outside of wedlock is worse than having an abortion. So I think it's, you know, it's kind of figuring all of these things out, um, seeing the way that particularly trans bodies are treated by medicine and thinking, ah, that feels very close. Like, I know, I know what this treatment's like, having somebody tell you how your body should be functioning or telling you that you've been, you know, that you know, lying to yourself, right? Or, or lying to you about methods and science. Finding out that science isn't, you know, is, is quite um, biased. It's not objective at all. I think all of these things is like, um, you know, the building blocks, like your reproductive justice, um, you know, starter kits of just kind of going out into the world and figuring out actually, you know, we're we're kind of in this together. When I when I have um, when I have a problem with uh, you know a, a gynecologist on the way that um, he speaks to somebody who's trying to have an abortion, but doesn't have the same problem with uh, let's say a migrant domestic worker, who you know if he's highly paid, well she's supposed to just be a worker here. She's not supposed to be having intimacy. She's not supposed to be um you know having um even and you know that's that's considering consensual sex also that you know um thinking about the racialized sexual violence that also domestic workers face that's not even in the conversation it's fixing a problem because um not you know i know we talk about you know compulsory motherhood but not all motherhoods are accepted not all motherhoods are welcome and i think you see that here a lot especially with refugee and migrant populations and because you know, Lebanon is a small country, but it's a small mess of a country that really has just a lot happening in it. And I think the part of reproductive justice that really spoke most to um, our like geographic location that I felt like kind of maybe even um, I didn't see as much uh, in it from, um, I guess, the North American um, side is I think the bit on war and conflict and you know um, occupation, and I think you know like I know that it's you know it's, it's the the framework speaks to it as you know thinking about uh, you know indigenous people absolutely, but what about you know what about you know and thinking about you know justice that's also like restorative and thinking about you know transformative justice and like a, a looking back sense, but what about the now happening right now right thinking about Palestine thinking about um, what's happening like also in Syria and um, and I think so for me reproductive justice also feels um, like it fills a gap um, that I guess in my in my work um, you know when you get into the sexual reproductive health and rights segment of life you know it's there's a lot of there's a lot of like empty like talk right there's a lot of like slogans there's a lot of like um, you know one one liners that sound really but but are empty from like um, my body, my choice, but it's like, yeah, whose bodies? So who, who are we talking about? 
um, and not all bodies are bodies that you're defending because I I see that statement gets used by you know uh, entities and, and, and institutions that um, also don't support like women for like maternal leave or don't hire uh, women who are black uh, brown or not or not national right so like this you know patriotic um, nationalist also um, uh, you know racism and xenophobia and so for me it's like um, I think you know being around um, this this language of sexual reproductive health and rights it always felt like there's something so that pulls me in because I think it always felt like the first offense the first offense as someone who's born like a woman who identifies as such like this is this is what I'm sized up to be and yet like you know there and there's a whole field of people working on this and yet there's something so reductive in the way that you know that that the movement sometimes um has has been seen the SRHR did very UN FDA stuff and it's it's a bit empty because it doesn't speak of political contexts it will tell you, you know, the right to have an abortion, the right to uh, sexual education, but it won't tell you about that for, you know, a, a child who's like born of like a single mom, who's a domestic worker in the country, or somebody who's born in a, you know, in a, in a refugee camp, or someone, or you know, it won't talk to you about like trans bodies. Like it won't, it won't address a lot of things. And so I think um, what I find, like I find solace in reproductive justice as a framework, is that. Um, it's not trying to pinpoint all the violations. It's providing you like a uh, like a, a way of thinking that actually even things that maybe I haven't come across in my readings. I'm like, let me go back to how I think about these parallel issues on these violations on our bodies and how medicine and state and religion have been playing with our bodies and our abilities to be able to really have self determination. Um, so yeah, so kind of, so by the time I found the word reproductive justice, I was like, oh, excellent. This is, this is perfect because this makes more sense. And we wrote something about it uh, at the Age Project. We wrote um, in pursuit of reproductive justice in Lebanon, but like kind of like making an argument for a conversation around this framework that, um, you know, moves away from siloing all of these different move, movements that we, we are in and actually towards like a real um, collaborative work on seeing reproductive justice and other movements and moving away from how people just kind of slap intersectional feminism across everything to make it sound like, well, kind of they're, you know, kind of in and of the same, but that's really not true. Um, yeah, I find it more purposeful. Thank you so much, Rola. Um, everything you've touched is, um, for example, like the political aspect of, um, um, the, the situation in which women and trans bodies are put in and then when we don't address those uh, stories, when we don't address those um, uh, situations, that we, it kind of, the pro-choice movement doesn't, it, it just feels very limiting. Um, but we can uncover those stories by, well, by, by telling those stories, right? And Loretta, you and your own, um, in, in so many interviews that I've seen with you and in your books, uh, you always uh, stressed the role of storytelling uh, for the reproductive justice framework. Um, could you explain why you think that is so important? Why storytelling um, is where you start? I entered the feminist movement by working to end violence against women. And I was the third executive director of the first rape crisis center in the United States. And so it was by telling our stories as rape and incest survivors that we grew our power, that we found out that we were not alone, that we could figure out what demands we were making of both the legal and the political and the medical communities that were not meeting the needs of people, particularly women affected by all the forms of violence, whether it was domestic violence, rape, economic violence, racial violence, immigration violence, all those violences were not being addressed by our system. So we thought, the way to make change is to tell our stories. Of course, we call them consciousness raising in the beginning. And then by the middle of the 80s, we called it self-help. 
And now we're just calling it self-care because it's so important to uh, make sure that we lift our voices because as Laura Deal Hurston said, if you don't lift your voice, they'll kill you and say that you asked for it. And so you have to always lift your voice. But one thing that has happened, at least in my consciousness over the last 10 years, because like I said, I've been doing this for more than 50, is that it's not that the politicians who oppress us haven't heard our stories, because that's what we've done. We've done nothing but tell our story, as well as organize and legislate and all of that. But it's not that they don't know our stories, it's that they don't care. And that's a different problem. Mm -hmm. When it's not just providing them with more facts, more information, more testimonies, but they hear the truth and act on a lie. That's a different political project. Mm -hmm. And so I don't wanna sound cynical because as Lily Tomlin said, no matter how cynical you become, you will never keep up with these idiots. But we have to make sure that we get the people who want to abuse their power out of power over our lives. And so this is our mission right now. Storytelling is vital for building movement, for calling out human rights violations, for sharing what happened to you, for establishing what is true. But it's not sufficient to protect you from people who don't care about your story. The first question. Is, um, and um, I think this question for you, Loretta, is very fitting. Because um, here um, someone is asking, seeing, well, like, how do you deal with setbacks? For example, don't you get discouraged? Um, where do you find inspiration and strength? Where do you not become too cynical? <laughs> oh, you're on, you're muted. <laughs> uh, I have to speak as a black woman in a white supremacist, neoliberal capitalist society. And so we have a saying in the black community and that is, at times like this, it's always been times like this. There's really, the abortion battle is fighting between two different groups of white people. And it's the same groups of white people that are divided on whether America is gonna be a democracy or devoted to white supremacy. So what exactly has changed for us? I'm not sure, my mother, had to do her social justice activism while raising eight kids while she worked on her hands and knees to clean white folks' houses. And so I never ever take the privilege of doing social justice activism for granted because she did it against much greater odds than I do. Now on a practical level, you can't stay on all the time because then the world just looks like really messed up and you become a Debbie Downer, always depressed and going around depressing other people. And then people don't wanna to talk to you because they don't always wanna be on. And so I've learned to have like a toggle switch inside my consciousness so that there are times when I'm totally on and going to give you the radical feminist analysis that you want. And there are times when I'm gonna watch Beyonce and not offer a feminist analysis <laughs> or, whatever, because that is not appropriate. But I learned early in my work, uh, a friend of mine told me in the civil rights movement, he said, Loretta, lighten up. He said, fighting fascists should be fun. It's being a fascist that sucks. And so you have to remember what side you're on. <laughs> and the revolution is supposed to be fun and irresistible and fulfilling. And if you're not having fun fighting fascists, maybe you're doing something wrong. <laughs> because 
They're the ones that don't have joy. They're the ones that go around murdering all these people and doing all those awful things. <clears throat> so I find myself both turning my consciousness on and off. And when I feel myself getting cynical, I can either remember what my mother went through and my father, because he was an immigrant who didn't have a high school education and worked three and four jobs to keep the family together. Or I can just turn it off and go watch Twilight or the Marvel Universe and not try to bring, you know, a bell hooks level analysis to what my eyes are seeing because I'm just having fun. And that's how you sustain yourself in the movement. You have to learn to party as hard as you work. Thank you so much. It's a great, it's a great reframing of the work <laughs> as we've been trying to do these also these past few weeks. Um, so stories, telling stories is one part of the side as we've just learned, right? Um, that will be, you know, people who have undergone those experiences then sharing their stories. But Kalpana, um, I guess, you know, research is a different kind of um, going into finding, looking for those answers, looking for um, kind of um, knowledge that has been not hidden, but hasn't been picked up on. Um, are there any areas of research that are still underfunded underrepresented in the field of reproductive justice, um, considering that you are a researcher yourself and like, what is it that you are looking at? What is it that you think that is so, so missing data? I mean, I, I would say that in a way, you know, research, especially in some, uh, uh, in the kind of issues we're talking about, which are political issues, they can, it can only have uh, meaning if it is, you know, available to and useful to, to political movements, including, you know, feminist movements, the ones we've been talking about and so on. So I think that that's very important, you know, that, you know, research can be done, but there are all kinds of ways in which it kind of can be kind of locked away behind paywalls, behind, you know, all of that. And, it, and in a way, I think that, um, you know, there's a real need which often doesn't happen for the acknowledgement to which, uh, to the extent to which researchers draw upon um, the insights which come out from those who are actually activists or those who are engaging in movements. So, I mean, that's something which I, you know, certainly I would take as a starting point for, for any work that I do. And, um, I mean, when you talk about funding, I think we need to be a little bit uh, careful here because I mean, you know, some of the work I've been doing has been looking at the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Gates Foundation, right? And, you know, as we know, that is like perhaps the most influential actor in terms of funding at the moment, in terms of um, sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I mean, they are tremendously, um, controlling through that of, uh, you know, what is funded and what isn't. And in many ways, um, you know, that, that relates to their particular agenda, the, you know, their focus on the promotion of uh, long acting reversible contraceptives, their work with the big uh, pharmaceutical corporations that they work in par partnership with and essentially promote, um, you know, so um, including, you know, I know many of our audience are in Germany, so, you know, Bayer is one of the big ones there, uh, which produces Jadel, which is a new version of Norplant, which, of course, uh, you know, feminist uh, sexual reproductive health advocates across the world have been campaigning against because of its uh, really dangerous impacts on women. Um, so, you know, the, the, the whole question of research and funding becomes, you know, a very political one. So it's not simply a matter of, oh, well, we haven't got onto this yet, so we need to think about funding it, because that funding is going to come with certain stipulations always. And, you know, um, uh, you know, I had the, the experience of uh, writing for the Guardian newspaper, um, about, uh, you know, the um, uh, FP20 launch conference back in 
2012, the family planning 2020, uh, 2020, now it's 2030 initiative, which is very much about promoting long acting reversible contraceptives. Uh, and when I wrote about it, uh, I was told that I couldn't actually mention that the Gates Foundation was one of the key players in that. Uh, and the reason was, of course, that the Guardian, uh, its development section is, is funded by the Gates Foundation. You know, so there's a tremendous level of policing there um, around, um, uh, you know, around media, around research and so on. The other thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, I think we need to be very wary of terms getting appropriated. Now, you know, we all have a lot of criticisms of the notion of reproductive rights, um, you know, and the way it's tended to be focused on individual choice and so on, and not recognizing structural oppressions. Um, but it's also something which has very much been sort of like appropriated by bodies like the Gates Foundation, like, uh, you know, uh, USAID and so on in various phases when oh, certainly when the Democrats have been in power. So, so, you know, we have to be very wary of this happening with reproductive justice too. You know, now I'm seeing, uh, you know, big NGOs, international NGOs kind of throwing in reproductive justice into their kind of, um, you know, uh, language without actually engaging with the kind of things Loretta has talked about, really using it just to talk about um, access to contraception very narrowly defined and assuming that, uh, you know, that can be, uh, you know, made available to women without, you know, as Loretta was saying, transforming the conditions of their lives and that that will, will solve everything. Um, but also then, you know, linking in with these uh, initiatives, which are actually about, actually about profit, actually about the promotion of certain contraceptives, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, uh, relationships with, uh, you know, big donors and so on. So I think, you know, we need to be quite, quite careful about, about that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kalpana. Um, so uh, there are so many questions and I hope we have uh, enough time, 20 minutes uh, to go through all of them. Um, Rola, I think I have a question for you here. Um, so Sara um, messaged me saying that, uh, well, she wants to, first of all, she wants to thank all the speakers for um, their inspiring insights. Uh, she's interested to know the um, speaker's perspectives on the reproductive justice framework and how it might intersect with sexuality education. Um, both with view to shortcomings within policies and frameworks from international organizations or um, development aid organizations, as well as contestations from ultra-religious networks. Um, Roland, with you working with the aid project, of course, also on sexuality education, um, um, what, what do you what would you say here? How does it intersect? Um, how does the framework intersect with sexuality education? Um, well, I I don't I don't feel like I don't know if I can speak on behalf of the framework, but I will speak on how it is that I feel like I practice uh, I practice it and how I am able to read um, to read the room right to read the the. The big, the bigger, the bigger room in that in that sense. And so for me, like you know, a lot of times people will say, "Ah, oh, the problem is we don't have we don't have comprehensive comprehensive sexuality education in schools at home here, like in, in Lebanon." And I keep thinking, I'm kind of I know this sounds maybe bad, but I'm not too upset with that because I would be terrified to think about the kind of comprehensive sexuality education that we might get because we forget who's going to be doing that, who's going to be who's going to be passing that information. And there's so much, I mean, looking at around the world where, you know, sexuality education in schools is already there, already the school, the school system is so, it's, um, it's incredibly, you know, it censors um, the, it, you know, I don't know, genitalia for one, uh, abortion as a reality, second, how sex happens maybe <laughs> as a third. Um, it's just a lot of, um, you know, fear mongering. It's a lot of harm. It's not even harm reduction. I mean, I wish I could say it had harm reduction. It's 
Um, it in fact is uh, dogmatic to um, making sure that you are on the normative path that you should be on as a student, right? So, you know, kids going to school, you know, um, having questions about, um, you know, um, attraction and desire that is not normative, that is not hetero. Um, this is not a recognized thing. In fact, there is a very fine punishment for having these thoughts or these feelings. I don't know what kind of sexuality education um, would make it to schools, but my understanding from countries that have it is there are a lot of organizations that keep working on undoing that comprehensive sexuality education. And so I feel I feel as though, you know, I'm not saying that, um, you know, I'm not saying that there isn't a gap created by that, but I'm very well aware of the messaging that's also in that. Um, and, you know, the kind of shame that people leave schools and, you know, feeling either disgusted by their bodies and, you know, thinking that, um, you know, any vaginal discharge is ill and, you know, using, uh, you know, consumerist capitalist like methods to, you know, um, to, to promote anything that could take away the smell of a vulva or put in panty liners because, you know, you mustn't leak as a woman. It's just, I'm just not really, I'm not, you know, and I'm not a big fan of the times that we did have comprehensive sexuality education, that it would be companies coming in to sell their products through a, something that is uh, supposed to be CSE, which it isn't. It's a talk on periods when they pull out the boys and they just tell us, you know, how to, you know, to buy this brand. It's quite disgusting. We're, we're 10 years old, so this is really quite amazing. But for me, like what I feel like we have the chance to do when we're thinking about grassroots organizing, we're thinking about community building and really putting in the politics that we believe in on sexual sexuality and in our bodies, is we have the chance to actually do like a community-based sexuality education that is different, that's not institutionalized through state and religion and um, you know and medicine in the way that it has misunderstood and um, in the way that it's misunderstood and 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 um, and restricted our bodies and uh, and lied lied to us lied to us about our bodies medical institutions in their medical textbooks. Uh, erasing the clitoris for a good, what, a, what was it, 60 years? I mean, I just, I don't know, I, you know, I have distrust, I mean, trust issues. So I feel, you know, I, I, I like the chance, I like the chance for us to do our own CSE, you know, um, in a way that speaks to our realities and our bodies to re-understand pleasure that isn't, um, you know, that isn't, you know, circulating a phallus, you know, in a dance or like that is not, penetrative, like, you know, um, focus, you know, um, you know, not to diss penetration and pleasure from that, of course, you know, it's, you know, just, I'm just saying that there is a way to be understanding these things um, in a, a, you know, in a way that opens up possibilities, especially thinking about people who are disabled, thinking about sexuality and disability, and, you know, when your body, you know, um, doesn't have the capacity to do something that is seen as the only legitimate sexual practice because patriarchy said so then you are erasing this entire body's possibility this person to experience a, a possibility of experiencing um you know intimacies and pleasure maybe even love right so it's um so yeah no i i think we could do better than the sexuality education that we're given or not given Thank you so much. Can I speak up before we go to the next question? Because I wanted to address Calpana's fear of the co-optation of reproductive justice, if that's okay. Yes, please. I did have a question on that, but now you're, <laughs> you're already. Well, the reason I wanted to speak to it, that if you look at the scholarship that we have done as Black women on it, we have made reproductive justice a criteria-based framework, not an identity-based framework. Even though it was created by Black women, because it's based on human rights, it applies to everyone, so everyone has the same human rights. But our intersectional identities, meaning our vulnerabilities because of those identities, say that those who have the most risk of human rights violations are the ones whose human rights need to be particularly attended to. Like we say, those with the least in life need the most from human rights. And so if you look at the writings of black feminists, you'll see criteria 
like human rights, intersectionality, uh, connecting global issues to local conditions, uh, to center the most vulnerable people in the lens, to understand that you can't use an individual solution to systemic problems and stuff. And so I have no concerns over the people who try to use reproductive justice because there's criteria which, which I can evaluate their efforts. And if their efforts don't meet the criteria, then that increases the chances that I'm gonna call them out for that. But if their efforts meet the criteria, then I'm going to name them and feel that they're part of the global reproductive justice movement. Thank you so much, Loretta. I did have a question on that, and so I'm, I'm glad you um, already picked up on it. Uh, there are a few other questions for you and um, that I'm getting. Um, perhaps I will start with um, Monica's question. Um, she writes, there's a lot of critique to human rights discourse from the progressive left. Um, why do you choose the human rights approach to talk about reproductive justice issues? I find that the progressive left has a lot of internalized white supremacy, just like the regressive right that they don't admit to. Uh, the first time the word human rights was used in the Black Liberation Movement was 1858, when Frederick Douglass called the lynching of a Black man in New York City a human rights violation. So as kidnapped and enslaved people, we've been demanding the human rights framework 90 years before the United Nations even wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And just because it's been codified and limited and abused by white people doesn't mean it's not a legitimate framework. Now, that doesn't mean it's a perfect framework either, because what has created, been created at the United Nations is a states-based system uh, for immorally established countries, you know, colonial boundaries and all of that. And then you've got countries like the United States undermining the entire human rights framework. And because that's part of their geopolitical economic strategy is to undermine human rights and stuff like that. But I find the left generally just cynical and largely unknowledgeable even about the human rights framework. Because if you ask most of the people who don't claim that human rights as a framework can work, they couldn't tell you those nine categories I just told you about. Because they don't know them. They think of human rights as a tortured political prisoner in a jail somewhere, and they just, in their arrogance, they don't think they have anything to learn from the global South. And so they poo poo it because they have this very imperialist view of even doing social justice activism. And so I, I'm gentle with them because I understand that we live in a country that is predicated on the violation of people's human rights. And so people aren't taught anything about human rights in our educational system. And when we do even mention the word human rights, we weaponize it in an attack against more vulnerable countries. And so I understand why people on the progressive left, let me just say this in closing. I mentioned Frederick Douglass, also Audre Lorde, also Dr. Martin Luther King, also Malcolm X, also Mary McLeod. I mean, so many of our Black heroes and sheroes have called on us to build a human rights movement. I tend to trust their reputations over some smart ass who has never, could, couldn't even tell me the nine categories I just named. <laughs> Thank you so much, Loretta. Um, Kalpana, I see you raised hand, but um, before you start, uh, Rola uh, messaged me that she would like to add um, to that. And once she's done, I will hand over to you, if that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I, I, I won't take much because I, because I, I'm, you're cracking me up already. I'm trying very hard not to laugh too, too, obviously. But, um, so with on the rights and um, versus justice kind of um, approach, um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, we use the tools that we have, you know, and, you know, so we'll say rights in some places because I think, you know, but, but it's not about, like, I think it's not about the terminology sometimes. It's really about what you're also, you know, lacing that conversation with. Um, so we can easily talk about reproductive rights in a very solid reproductive justice framing. It's not a problem. But what I find, though, I think in the translation sometimes here, or just the way that human rights have been kind of sold as um, as like a savior package for you know the global south and particularly here as a way of being able to overcome difficulties in you know in places where you have a lot of corruption and you know some people look at human rights as the only maybe tool you can use but it also the dissonance between human rights as a framework and when you don't have that much to work with when you know laws aren't respected when laws are actually shouldn't be respected the way that they're written either you know so it's um it, it feels like some at some point it's a, like an escape to look at something that is hard to find at home but also it also has maybe because of you know um the kind of money that flows from the north to south and like development um, it's usually also attached with a lot of eyes about, oh, are you part of the human rights people, right? Because it just feels a little bit like empty sometimes. But in fact, I found that the co a conversation around justice here speaks to people a lot more, especially like working class people, except especially people who aren't trying to intellectualize a conversation and using human rights as just, you know, plugins. I find that justice has always had um, like a time traveler type of activity, right? Justice can go backwards. Rights have always felt very now and forward. And when we kind of use rights in conversations with people around, you know, SRHR, they'll say, yeah, but what about what's happened to us? You know, what rights doesn't seem to be able to get you justice. And so I feel like also in the translation of the word rights, sometimes it translates here to the word law and law and rights are not synonymous. They don't fit. And so justice as adele sounds very separate than uh, rights as which is which could, you know, which like the school, you know, um, university about, you know, on, on law, teaching law to students, it's uh, it has the same words as rights, but law and rights are different. So I think there's also a little bit of that and thinking about who uses it and when and the kind of connotations it has. Thank you so much for that uh, really important distinction. Kalpana. Yeah, I mean, just, just to sort of um, add to that in a way, I mean, I think that is such an important point about the way concepts kind of travel and don't and get translated, you know, and it's so important to think about that. And in a way, I also wanted to say that, you know, in a way, it's quite similar when we talk about the left and what we mean by that, because I, you know, I completely, um, you know, uh, know what Loretta is saying about the left in the US and, and, you know, in the UK as well, where I'm based, right? I mean, it's it's definitely not immune from um, racism and, and white supremacy. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I'm aware that like a lot of the, you know, the feminists I'm working with in, in uh, India, for example, who are at the at the forefront of this um, of struggles for reproductive justice, do identify as part of of the left. So the left also is something which uh, you know is global. There's an anti-imperialist left. There's an anti-fascist left in the global in in many places in the global south. So just to say that you know again, it's sort of about how how things translate as well, and that. Um, you know, in a way for them, they feel like like Marxism is something organically rooted in their experiences. If you look at the way uh, it's evolved, you know, the main contributions have been actually from people in the majority world. You know, uh, that's where revolutions have happened, right? That's where um, theory is also developed, you know. So, so just to kind of uh, bring that in as well. But uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, since looking at the clock, we only have a few minutes left, but I have a very, um, I have two questions left that I would like to combine together. Um, Naida um, talked a lot about, and um, talked, talked about uh, the concept of calling in, Loretta's concept of calling in, uh, rather than calling out. And um, 
she wanted to um, ask if there was anyone left to call in. <laughs> the, the right is always more united in their agendas. And she asked, how do we unite again? And then there was the other question um, about, um, and I think it's, it's a very good question in combination. Who would you say were the best allies in the fight for, for reproductive justice? Um, and, you know, how do we make a mass movement instead of everyone fighting for their own agenda? And I guess, um, you know, a closing question to all of you would be, um, if I were to combine it, um, how can we apply the reproductive justice framework to build a broad alliance um, for reproductive autonomy? Please, Loretta. <laughs> Um, you should I, mean, um, you should, yeah. I think that uh, both Rola and Kapana are onto something when they said that instead of the rights language resonating and aligning around the world, it's the justice language that is resonating and aligning around the world. You know, whether it's economic justice, racial justice, reproductive justice, food justice, health justice. We're in the 21st century, in the 21st century, is going to be a century of alignment. And I'm convinced of this, not because I'm into woo-woo astrology, but because I am seeing people who formerly were practicing forms of political purity, finding that they have many more allies than they imagine once they let go of their stupid standards of perfect political alignment you know, perfect political agreement and, you know, not treating people who don't use the exact same language or get the right gender pronouns right and all that as the enemy. I mean, we have to stop majoring in the minor stuff and understand that we have to build an anti-fascist movement to fight the global rise of fascism. And so that's why I invented the calling in process so that we could do a better threat assessment to know who an actual enemy is versus someone who doesn't want to play language games with us. Thank you so much. Um, who wants to start on, on, uh, on well, the question of how we can apply the framework to build a broad alliance? Rola or Kalpana? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I'd just like to kind of echo really what Loretta said, that the need of the hour is this broad anti-fascist alliance and that it has to be a global one, that it has to be, uh, you know, an, an anti-imperialist one, that we have to see, for example, um, you know, the role of uh, not just states and governments, but of, of corporate capital in this, because they are benefiting from these, from these regimes which are rolling back women's rights in so many different ways. And I think that's really important. I think that, you know, um, you know, because I work on India, uh, we're facing a, a very openly, uh, you know, Hindu supremacist fascist regime. They've been, you know, it's, it's on the verge of a genocide of its Muslim minority. So these are very, very urgent questions. And I think, um, you know, as, as everything which both uh, Loretta and Rola have said, shows how reproductive justice is at the center of that of that uh, of that anti-fascist struggle you know and i think uh reproductive justice has to you know be as broad as possible to incorporate those struggles and at the same time those kinds of uh fascist attacks have to also be looked at through a reproductive justice lens and i think it's been an amazing uh, panel in, in helping us think think through doing that. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to leave, I'm afraid. So um, just wanted to say really honored to be part of this. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kalpana. Thanks a lot. Rora. Yeah, I, for me, I think, um, I think trying to, trying to adopt a reproductive justice framework to the way that we've been organizing has helped me maybe get past some of the um, these the, you know political diplomacies within these alternative political spaces, um, where it's not you know it, we I'm I I am also tired of um, 
you know, te technicalities and like language um, play. And I think to some extent, like the co-option also of like a lot of, um, you know, like a lot of feminist politics and there's, you know, feminism has, you know, from when I was a kid, you know, you're called feminist, that was an insult. Now, if you're not a feminist, that's an insult, right? So it was, it's quite different. The world has really changed quite radically over the last, um, my, my lifetime. I'm not very young, but not very old either. So this is, it's a lot of, it's a lot of changes. Um, so for me, I think just kind of thinking in the spaces where we organize, um, pushing forward reproductive justice is not just another feminist trying to push her agenda. It's actually saying, you know, you want to talk about women, you know, you want to talk. So when you talk about, uh, you know, when you talk about like a no borders fight, right, or we talk about, um, you know, we, we protest against, um, you know, war and particularly like, you know, US involvement in war in, in this region or about, you know, um, Zionism also, you know, and uh, occupation. Like for me, this is, you know, you, that people who fight for all of these good things, which, you know, I do too, but I, I work within this framing, but I don't for, I don't not for, it's not about forgetting or not forgetting. It's about centering that, well, where I look first to see if something fits as if it fits with, you know, uh, migrant domestic workers, if it fits with refugees, if it fits with um, trans youth, if it fits with, you know, people of, you know, I mean, you know, minorities is, is one way of saying it, but it's, you know, there are a lot of women in the world and I'm feeling very minority in a majority position. And so for me, it's, um, it's about thinking about across these lines and trying to say, well, you know, um, you could fight for um, liberation, but how about also addressing the fact that these chemicals that have been dumped from, you know, warplanes have ruined um, women's bodies, their possibility for fertility and having children has given birth to multiple, um, you know, fetal uh, abnormalities and deformities. And within a place that where disability rights are not accessible, where women can have to do triple the amount of work you already overworked with reproductive labor, um, having children and the number of children you have, having a disabled child over that is difficult. It's, it's almost impossible. And thinking about how war has created that, how, you know, uh, planes that dropped in Ida um, by, you know, Americans, by U.S. Um, warfare has changed people's bodies for generations to come. This is reproductive justice. This is saying fight, yes, fight absolutely against imperialism, but let's also talk about what that did, not only for who took what oil, which now is too expensive anyway. Let's talk about you know, what happened, the longstanding effects that everybody who lives here still has to face. So, so I think this is where reproductive justice fits for me as a framework. I'm not saying be intersectional, tick all my token boxes. I'm saying in the thing that you care about, there is an element that is so crucial that is about our bodies. And this is something that needs to be um, put forward first. Thank you so much, Jonah. Uh, Loretta, I have just one last question and perhaps because of the time, um, if you have maybe a sentence if you want to. <laughs> um, the question is, I mean, we're talking to one of the co-founders of Reproductive Justice. And um, I guess the question is, how can we further develop um, the concept of reproductive justice in a way that honors the co-founders? I like the flexibility of reproductive justice because it's a human rights-based framework that different people who adapt it can apply it and flex it to their own specific issues. I love the way indigenous women in this country always talk about sovereignty as a reproductive justice issue. Or immigrant women talk about it as an immigrant rights issue. Or people who are stateless or landless talk about it as a right to belong issue. I love reproductive justice because it's not limited in its theory and it's infinite in its applicability. That's what I like about it. That's a great story. Thank you so much uh, to both of you and of course to Kalpana as well. And now I would want to hand back to Deria. 
Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Loretta. It was so inspiring. Um, thank you, Kalpana, who's not here anymore. Uh, thank you, Rola. And also, Sham, I want to thank you for guiding us through this crazy, um, these crazy two months of learning so much. Um, it was a pleasure. Um, also to the technical team and my colleagues, Jana, Neda, and um, Adna, I think we, I learned so much and I am sure we will work together on this anti-fascist, anti-imperialist, anti-racist alliance. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wish us all a lot of strength and also fun. Thanks, Loretta, for stressing this part. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to the translators also. <laughs>